Shall we open our Bibles at this time to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6? We're in a series called Key Questions in Scripture. And what we're doing is going through the Word of God and examining those parts of it that are questions. And we've come to this part of our study that we have called intellectual questions, and we gave them that name because in this category of questions, they are those type of questions in the Bible that are given to make us think, to cause us to use our minds and our intellects to allow the Lord to put something into our lives that would improve us. And so in particular, these are questions that tend to push into philosophical concepts and, and things that require a bit of, of uh, thinking to deal with. Uh, and so we're going to talk about a question today, and I'm paraphrasing the question. We'll find it in the Word of God in just a moment. But the, the basic question is, is, can worrying improve things? That's a good question, isn't it? And Jesus puts it a certain way, and we're going to unpack what he taught us in this teaching about uh, this idea of worrying and fretting. And so Jesus was speaking uh, on the mount. We call this the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus spoke a lot of great and wonderful teachings in there about blessed are the meek and blessed are the poor. And, and then we have all these other wonderful things that he taught. But then he comes to this particular place and he just gives us a lesson. Now, I just want to stop for a moment and just kind of set this idea, this concept, because you see, Jesus came to save our souls. That's the number one thing Jesus came to do. He came to die on the sins to save us uh, from hell, to, to give us heaven. But while he was here, he also taught us a lot of other things that are helpful and good. Jesus came to save our souls, but he also came to give us a better way to think, a better way to look at the world. Uh, because if we're going to serve Him, if we're going to live for Him, we need to have a worldview that is inspired by the words of Christ. In other words, to be a Christian means more than just having a fire insurance policy against hell. To be a Christian means we have someone who has taught us how to think and how to live. And this is a sermon that He gave us that goes to that very point. How should we as Christians think? All right, so let's look at Matthew chapter 6, and we'll come to verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Now I just want to stop with that first part and say this. When Jesus said this, it was translated into this word, take no thought. Now, if we take that literally, take no thought, that means that when we get up in the morning, we shouldn't even think about eating. We do. That when we have time to, to get dressed, we don't think about putting on clothes. We do. Do you see what, how absurd that is to take it too hyper-literally? Uh, Jesus isn't saying don't think. He's not saying don't use your brains. Uh, the Greek in this, it means don't be anxious. We would say today, don't worry about these things. It isn't that you don't think about them at all. That's not what Jesus is teaching. Jesus wouldn't teach us to not use our minds. But what he is teaching us is not to worry, not to fret. That's what the context this is, is, is in. All right, he said, Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not better, much better than they? Which of you, and here is where we take our theme question, which of you, by taking thought, or by being anxious or worrying, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought. Again, he's saying, don't be anxious about these things. Don't worry about these things. Saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. 
But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Dear Father, I pray that you would help us to learn what you're teaching us. Lord, to learn it in a practicing way. To learn it so that each day we actually do it. We actually think the way you've taught us to think, and we do the things you've taught us to do. Lord, I pray that this sermon will stick. I pray that it'll stick very well. Lord, in our hearts and in our minds, help us to do the thinking that this is required of us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus looked over a crowd of people that we would consider today to be poor people, average people, working class people. Many of them perhaps were feeling blessed just to have enough uh, clothes to wear to stay warm and enough food to eat today. And Jesus taught them not to worry, not to fret. And, and so this is one of the things that Jesus taught. And so if Jesus taught it, we ought to learn it. Uh, if Jesus taught it, then I ought to teach it uh, from the Word of God as well. And so I am hoping that today that I can, as best as I can, unpack the truths that are found in this passage of Scripture and, and, and present it in such a way as that we get it and it comes in to, and be part of who we are. So first of all, I just want to make this point. Jesus is basically saying, don't worry. Now that's one of those verses in the Bible that's easy to say but hard to obey. It's like that one that says, be ye holy, for I am holy. It's in there, but do we do that? Well, more often than not. Don't worry. Now let me ask you. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because I don't want to force any of you to lie. <laughs> do you worry? Have you ever worried? I'll have to say I sometimes worry. I sometimes fret. And I haven't run into anybody yet who at some time or another hasn't done that. Now, that's why Jesus is talking about it, because it's a problem. It's a thing. Uh, Jesus doesn't tell us, thou shalt not fly to the moon and back, because we can't do that. It's not an issue. I've never had to say, well, you know, I wish my members would stay in church. They keep flying to the moon and back. It's not an issue, but they can worry. That's an issue. That's something we can do, and we often do. So Jesus' opening thesis was saying, don't be anxious. Don't be worked up in your heart and mind about these things. Take no thought is just an old English way of saying that thing. So Jesus did not teach us to quit using our brains. He didn't teach us to not think. What he's teaching us is to think, but don't worry. There's a difference between these two things. So Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7 puts it this way. And by the way, everything Jesus taught here is reflected in the, in the New Testament, in, in the writings of the apostles. Philippians 4, verse seven, uh, 6 and 7 says, Be careful for nothing. Be careful for nothing. In other words, don't be anxious. Don't worry about these things. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And if we do that, here's what will happen. The peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So when we find ourselves worrying and fretting, here's what we do. We go to the Lord in prayer, and we lay it before Him, and we forget about it. And we accept that peace that He offers to us so that we no longer have to worry about it. He keeps our hearts and minds. This is a spiritual exercise because we actually believe in God. We believe He exists. We believe He cares. And we believe what Jesus taught us, that if He says don't worry, there's a reason that we can do that. And that is we let Him do the worrying for us. And listen, God has got it all taken care of. Uh, God never goes around in heaven like this. Oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I didn't see that coming. You know, God's not worrying and fretting in heaven. That's what we do when we fail to trust God. So God is saying, let me handle that. Let me deal with that. Now, another one, and it's just another point, is worry doesn't help. Worry doesn't help. Now, what we need to realize that uh, worrying is wasted energy. It is wasted energy. It doesn't help a thing. Now, when do most of us do our, our best worrying? When we should be sleeping. Am I right? 
That's when we do our, our, our best and worst worrying. Uh, when we're busy in the daytime, we're distracted by many things, but you wake up in the middle night and, you know, you're trying to go back to sleep, right? So you're, you're not doing anything other than trying to go back to sleep. And that's when all these problems arise, these puzzles, these, solu- these things that defy solution and the things that we're concerned about and they start coming into our minds. Now, let me ask you this. Can you do anything about that right then? Is, is anything you're doing then going to help the situation? No. So it's just depriving you of sleep and depriving me of sleep at a time when God has blessed us enough to give us the nighttime so that we can take our rest, take our repose, so that the next day we can be productive human beings. We are robbing ourselves of blessings by fretting and worrying. So worry does not help. Uh, Jesus said, which of you? Which of you? Jesus is looking out over a crowd and he says, is anybody here has the mental telepathic power that if you think hard enough, you can, you can make yourself taller? Now, many believe that in the Greek, it has more to do with timeline. And some versions of the scripture actually interpret it this way. Can you, by taking thought, add a, 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 a day to your life or a week to your life? It's the idea, can you improve your life? Can you make yourself better by worrying about it? No. Uh, You can stretch and you can think and you can ponder and you can use all the powers you can. But listen, you're going to be that tall when you're done. Now listen, I I know one thing. If I stretch up all the way and I stretch up as tall as I can, I can just barely make five foot eleven and a half. But on my driver's license, it says six feet. (laughs) Because I used to could be six feet. I used to could stretch out to that. Now I can't stretch out to that. Time and gravity has done its work. And there'll come a time when I get my driver's license, I'll probably be 5'10 or less. But I'm not going to think hard and grow and become taller by thinking. I'm not going to add time to my life by fretting and worrying. In fact, it's very possible and very likely that all your fretting and worrying is going to do is shorten your life because it adds stress. You're more likely to die of a heart disease or a stroke or just worry yourself to death like people have, catch some illness. Because here's what I've learned from the medical world, that having anxiety and being fretful can lower your immune system and you're more likely to catch something that you wouldn't have caught if you had been healthier and had a better attitude. That's just a medical fact. So, so listen, Jesus knows how we're put together. And Jesus is teaching us that worry doesn't help. You're not going to make something good uh, just by thinking about it. Now, people have this idea today about positive, the power of positive thinking. And to a degree, there's some principles there about positive thinking. But within, within the limits, I agree. But listen, you know what is true? I can think positively all I want, and my bank balance is still my bank balance. I could tell my wife, honey, I'd like to buy me a Maserati. I want a Maserati. Now, my wife's an accountant, bookkeeper, math person. Somebody who knows what good sense is. <laughs> and she would point at our bank balance, and that's all she'd have to say. And I could say, well, I'm sending some positive vibes out there. Now, how ridiculous. All the positive vibes in the world isn't going to change that one penny more. If I want a big, fine, fancy car, I'm going to have to do something besides send out positive vibes. Now, often you hear somebody say, let's send our thoughts their way. Well, have you ever been sitting there and just thoughts come your way from somewhere? I'm sitting here and I'm going through a tough time and all of a sudden some thoughts came my way. Oh, somebody must have sent their thoughts my way. Now I feel better. No, that's nonsense. You send prayers that way and God can do wonderful things. But your thoughts sent out don't mean anything. I I can think anything in the world. It's not going to change. So this is a philosophical question Jesus is going to. He said, which of you, by thinking, can improve your life? Uh, You you just can't make up your own reality. You can't just think yourself rich or think yourself well. Uh, It's okay to have a good positive attitude. That's within the, the idea of having a good temperament. 
But let's just understand that Jesus is teaching us that thinking and worrying and fretting isn't going to produce anything. It does not help. Now, within the context of this teaching is this wonderful truth. God is good. Now, Jesus is asking us to consider nature, to consider how God is. And he he brings up some things about the birds. He brings up some things about the lilies. He even takes care of the birds, the birds. God has provided in his nature, even though it's fallen and even though there's a curse on it, God still provides for birds. He provides for plants. So Jesus is giving us some object object lessons, so let's look at them. He told us to consider the birds. Well, let's look at the birds. Let's think about the birds. Now, how is it that the birds get to eat? Do they sit on a limb? I'm not talking about the little birds that are depending on mama and papa bird. I'm talking about the full-grown birds. Do they sit on a limb and open up their mouths, and God sends angels to drop worms in their mouths? No. What are the birds doing all the time? They're going here and there looking for food. They're working. Uh, Listen, if a bird had a time clock that they punched every day, uh, they'd they'd have a, a thing over there, go look for worms. That's their job. Go look for something to eat. And they'd punch in and they'd do that until they're tired, until they got full and they'd be done. Listen, so birds, but see, it's provided. There's food out there. You just got to go get it. Now, I think God pointed us to the birds to realize you know, birds are busy. They're, God doesn't expect us to be lazy. God doesn't expect us to sit around and hope somebody who is working will give us something for free. That's the American culture today, but it's not the culture we find in the scriptures. In the scriptures, people are always expected to work. Everybody worked. Women worked. Grandmas and grandpas worked. Children, as soon as they were old enough, worked. Everybody worked. Listen, birds work. I've never seen a bird starve to death because it was too lazy to go hunt for something to eat. They all work. And so birds are an example for us. Another one is the lilies. Now, you ever think about all these beautiful plants out there, some of which I think are designed for no other reason but just to look pretty? Now, all plants aren't pretty, are they? Some of them are just plants. You know, I talked not too long about kudzu. There's nothing good about kudzu. It is green, but it's destructive and it tears up other things. I think the devil planted kudzu after the fall. I I blame it on the fall. But there's some plants that are just beautiful. Look at the flowers. Uh, Jesus was at a field and they could all look over and see the lilies. And he said, think about the lilies. I mean, uh, God's in control of that. God's in control of nature. And the lilies are are clothed. And you see, here's what I'm thinking. People weren't as concerned about having enough to wear to cover their nakedness. My thinking was he's going to this idea about people that are concerned with having really nice clothes, looking really good. That seems to be people's obsession today. Now, I've got a closet. You've got a closet. Do you realize if you can open up your closet today, if you can open up your closet and find more than one or two changes of clothing, you're you're, you're richer than most people in the history of the world has ever been. I've got shirts in there I don't even wear just because, yeah, maybe I'll wear them one day. I should get rid of them. I should give them to somebody who can wear them. Uh, of the shirts in my closet, I probably wear half of them. The other half are just there taking up space. In fact, when I get home, I'll probably deal with it because I'm under conviction now. Now, here's my point. We are rich. We've got plenty to wear. If, if any of us are worrying about clothes, it's not that we're worrying about we won't have enough to cover our naked bodies with. We're thinking about, I don't have any stylish clothes. I don't have any nice clothes. That's what we're worrying about. Uh, listen, ordinary folk always had something. Maybe they didn't have the, the rich outer garment all the time, but they had something to wear. And, and so the idea that only the wealthy had multiple changes of clothing. Now, this teaching that God clothes the lilies, he will clothe you, is something, that, a concept that goes to the point that God's going to answer at the end of this passage. So we just kind of have to hold on to that, okay? There are things that we really need, and then there are things that we really, really would like to have. And listen, God understands this. 
God understands all this about us, so hold that thought. Now, along with this is uh, point number four I want to make, is God values you. Now, Jesus said a couple of times here, are ye not of greater value than birds? Are ye not of greater value than the lilies of the field? If God will do this for birds, won't he take care of you? If God clothes the lilies of the field, won't he clothe you? Now, the idea is, listen, God values you. He doesn't just value humanity. He does that. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. But, but he values you. Jesus didn't just die for the world. He did that. Jesus died for you. He died for me. God values me. Why? Because I'm worthy? No. He values me because of his love. He values me because he chose to. And therefore, we should trust him. If God values me, I'm okay. I'm going to be okay. He's going to take care of me. Now, along with this also is number five. Don't think like an unbeliever. Now, that parenthetical passage that we read, I'll read it again. He was talking to them about how to think. And then he said for this, For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Now, that's the nations. Now, what is Jesus saying? Okay, he's saying, don't worry and fret about things. That's what people out in the world who don't have faith do. You see, the Gentiles, that was a catch-all word for those who were outside of the faith. Those who didn't understand Scripture. Those who didn't have the enlightenment from God. They're just based in this world, and that's how they think. God, Jesus was telling them, don't think like an unbeliever thinks. Think like a Christian thinks. We are to have a worldview that's based on the words of Christ. Christ followers are supposed to think better and live better than those out in the world. Now think about it. Jesus is sitting on the mount, and he's preaching to these people, and he's telling them, this is how to be righteous. This is how to be good. This is how to please God. And, and part of that, he said, listen, don't, don't think like the world thinks. You're not of the world. If you have come to me, and if you are my disciple, you have a higher mind and a higher heart than they're supposed to have. And therefore, think and live like that. Now, this concept is found all through the New Testament. The Christian is not only to have a fire insurance policy against hell, we are to have a new worldview. We are to have a better life. We are to possess a distinctively Christian worldview that affects our thoughts and attitudes and actions that makes us better as human beings. In Matthew chapter 20, turn with me if you will. Matthew chapter 20, and we'll look at verse 25. Okay, verse 25. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. Now, let me just catch the context here. The disciples were having a dispute about which of them would be the greatest in the kingdom, which would be the higher rank, uh, which would be the ruler over the others. They were, they were having this discussion. And so Jesus is addressing that mentality. And here's what he says. You know that the princes or the powerful people of the nations, the, the, the worldlings, exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them, but it shall not be so among you. Now, what is he saying? He's saying, listen, Christians, listen, disciples, listen, those of you who profess my name and are going to live according to my teachings, don't have a caste system. Don't be concerned about who's up and who's down, who's powerful and who's weak, uh, who's ruling and who's being ruled over. That's not your game. That's not what you're here for. He goes on to say, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. In other words, you want to be a good Christian? You want to be one of the better ones? Just serve. Serve. And whosoever will be chief among you, <laughs> let him be your servant. In other words, you want to be a big shot Christian? Then don't be a big shot. You want to be somebody? Then, then, then don't be somebody. Except somebody who serves. 
That's the greatest you can. Listen, in the Christian faith, you know who the best people are? The people who just serve. They meet the needs of others. They, they say, what can I do? And they do it. You know, I love this thing about <laughs> we're worker bees. We're worker bees. We show up and we do work. I, I had one fellow at one time, and he was one of these ladder climbers, you know. And he, he wanted to be bigger. He wanted to be better in the church. And so he asked me, which was a mistake, you know, uh, to ask me what he could do. And I said, okay, here it is. Show up, have a good attitude, find a need uh, and, and do your best to meet it. Find somebody who's hurting and help them, uh, you know, do something that needs to be done and do it and, and don't brag about it and don't let me, people know about it. That's the best you can do. He didn't like my answer. Well, the thing is, listen, if, if, you, if your goal is to be a big shot, you're in the wrong club. Think about it. Jesus was the highest being in the world. He was God himself. Equal with the Father, equal with the Holy Spirit, enjoying the praise of angels. What did he do? He came down here to serve. And he came down here to wash disciples' dirty feet. And he came down here to take our sins upon himself. Jesus is our example. Don't think like an unbeliever. He said, whoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. We are to not think like the world thinks. Now, the the world worries about everything. They're all the time competing. Who's up? Who's down? Who's best? Who's in? Who's out? All of this thing goes on. You, You know where the whole bullying thing comes from? It's the pecking order. I'm tougher than you. I'm more powerful than you. I'm more hip than you. I'm more popular than you. And and there are people who cannot feel good about themselves until they have put someone else down. There are people who can't feel like they're rising unless they're pushing someone else down. Listen, Jesus said the best way to rise is to go low in humility. Because God is able to take the the, the proud and abase them. He's able to take the, the humble and raise them up. And so don't think like the world thinks. We have a better way to think given to us by Jesus. Now, within this is also this concept. Number six, align your priorities. Align your priorities. Now, he asked this interesting question. Is not the life more than food? Is not the body more than clothes? Now, what is he saying here? It's a deep subject. It causes us to think. The life more than food. Now, as I understand it, this is the way I look at it. We are supposed to eat to live, not live to eat. There's a big difference between those two concepts. There are some people who live to eat. They are so wrapped up in the whole culinary thing and their epicures that from the time they wake up to the time they go to bed, all they're thinking about is the enjoyment and the pleasure of food. Now, now God made us have taste buds so that we could taste our food so that we could enjoy it and have a good meal. That's a blessing from God. But listen, you can take anything to an extreme and you can end up hurting your soul and your body as a result. So the idea is to line your priorities. Now, he also said, is not the body more than clothes? Now, if you've got time and money, and you spend more time and money on having nice clothes than you do taking care of your body, your priorities are out of whack. It would be better to have a less expensive wardrobe and a healthier body than to have a sicker body and a a very elaborate wardrobe. The idea is think about what's important. What's what's important for you? I'm going to touch on something that I think Maybe ought to be said. Sometimes women wear on their feet shoes that were designed by people who believe in torture. I don't get it. Now, I understand that it's fashionable. It's fashionable. I understand it. But listen, I, I've known of women who have had to have operations on their feet to correct the malformations and the problems that cause from walking on their tiptoes all the time in shoes that are fashionable but not practical. Now, I'm just going to say that and move on. I'm not going to linger on it. But I'm just saying, think about it. What are you doing to yourself? Is not your foot more important than your shoes? 
You say, well, they sure are nice shoes. Yeah, but they hurt your feet and they make bunions and they're sore and you can't walk on them for 10 minutes without hurting. You don't see men doing that, do you? I'm just laying it out there. Just laying it out there. I'll move on. I know, I know sometimes preaching is stepping on toes, and, but I'm trying to help you. Now, align your priorities. Notice we are promised that if we trust God and do what we're supposed to do, He will provide us with the basic things of life. This is what Jesus is teaching us here. So this temporary world we live in is a rat race. And listen, nobody wins that race. If you're in the rat race, you're a loser right there. You're in it. All the people in the rat race are all of them losers. It's not a winning game. Uh, the only race that counts is to be more Christ-like and to serve and to be content and happy in your life. Listen, if you've got a smile on your face, if you've got a nice worldview, if you can go to bed at night smiling and thanking the Lord for what He's done for you, even though it may not be as much as what has happened to someone else, then you are a winner in life. And Jesus wants us to think like winners and be winners because the lowest Christian who has the least, who has peace in his or her heart, is a winner in Jesus Christ. And we are supposed to live with that idea in our minds and hearts. So, we understand this. Now, let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. I just want us to, I want to hammer on this point a little bit. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, it's in the concept of money. And he said, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Now, doesn't that put our priorities in place. Every one of us came into this life with nothing. And when you leave, you're not taking anything with you. Everything is here is just for here, and it's just a short amount of time. So big deal. The Bible says we're, we come in here with nothing, we go out with nothing. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Wouldn't you like to add to that list a little bit? But there it is. Now, why is that in the Scripture? Having food and raiment be content. Listen, because for the most part of the world, and in most parts of the world, and in most times of the world, people were doing pretty good if they had those two things and not much else. They were doing pretty good if they had some food to eat today and something to wear. Are those people not able to be good Christians? Are those people not able to have peace? Are those people not able to have the joy of the Lord? You see, the, the Scripture is universal. It's for every culture and every time. And should our affluent society be reduced to a point where we are doing pretty good just to have some clothes and just to have something to eat, we will still be Christians. We will still have the peace of God. We will still have comfort that He cares about us. So I would like to add to this a house a car that works, high-speed internet. I like to add things like that. But guess what? If all these things were taken away from me, I'm still a Christian. I still got a wonderful God who loves me. But they that will be rich, in other words, if being rich is your goal, if being rich is what you're all about, they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money, not money as is often incorrectly said, the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So align your priorities. What's important? Well, your life is important. And your, your, your mind and your heart and your peace is important. Lastly, God will provide. We are told this in Scripture. Jesus said that if we place the kingdom of heaven first and His righteousness, all these things will be added to you. What was He talking about? Food? clothing. These things that you need to survive will be added to you. God is saying to us that if you put me first, I'll take care of you. If you live for me, I'll meet your needs. I'll take care of you. We find this in other places in Scripture. Psalm 37, verse 25, even in the Old Testament, David said, I have been young and now am old, 
Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. What he's saying is, I've lived a long time, and I've seen that God takes care of his people. Luke chapter 18, verse 28. Peter was one to ask the questions that the others were thinking to ask, but didn't ask. Peter would ask it. And Jesus was talking about those that would leave the world and follow him. So in Luke 18, verse 28, Then Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or parents, or brethren, or wife, or children, for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time, and in the world to come everlasting life. Now, let's generalize this before we particularize it. To generalize it means this. If you have chosen to follow Christ, you cannot lose. And whatever you think you might have lost, you haven't lost, but you have gained in a better way. And Jesus talked about not only heaven, but he talked about this life. Now listen, there are people who, when Jesus was preaching this, when Jesus was teaching this, and when the apostles were preaching these truths, there were people who, in order to become a Christian, would be kicked out of their family. And sometimes they would lose their job. Sometimes they would lose their parents. Their parents would write them off. Sometimes even their wife would leave them, and they would find themselves alone. And you know what Jesus is saying? You haven't lost you have it lost. And what they'll do is they'll come find a church family and they'll have more friends than they ever lost. When Jesus was teaching one time, he was teaching and his own mother and his own half-brothers were concerned about him. He was so bold and he was so dogmatic and he was so fiery that they, they thought for a moment that he was beside himself. In other words, they thought he's lost his mind. It wasn't a good day for Mary. And so they went and they said, hey, master, your mother and your brethren are here to seek you. And you know what he said? Who is my mother? Who, who are my brethren? They that hear the word of God and keep it. What Jesus was saying here is this is my family. This is an earthly family. And he gave respect to them. But this is my real family. Now later they came along. Even his brothers came along and believed on him. And some of them wrote scripture. Isn't that great? After the resurrection they became believers. But what is the point here? The point is here, listen, generalizing the point. If you come to Christ, you cannot, cannot lose. Now let's particularize it. I believe with all my heart that any particular thing you gave up, God's going to make that up for you and more so. He even said a hundredfold. Now that takes in eternity because I'll tell you, I don't think anybody gets a hundredfold in this life. Some of it, yes, but not all of it. So I believe that if we believe the Word of God, we're going to get a hundred times whatever we lost, and there's no problem with it. Listen, you can't lose following Christ. The only thing that you can lose is to fail to follow Christ. You can lose a great deal, but to follow Christ, you cannot lose. Jesus promised us that following Him does not make us losers. We can trust the words of Christ. When we make Him number one, then he says he will take care of us and he will meet our needs. So what do we do when we wake up in the middle of the night and we begin to think and we begin to worry and we begin to fret? What should we do? We should do what the scriptures tell us to do. Lord, I've got some problems. You know all about them. You're better with them than I am. But Lord, I need my sleep and you've given me this time to sleep. Take those thoughts. Take those worries. You're on top of it. I'm going to do my best to deal with things when I'm awake, but now I'm going to sleep. And try your best to let the Lord deal with it. Here's the thing. We'll get better sleep. We'll have a better attitude in life. We'll get more positive things done when we replace worry with trust. And when we replace worry with faith. And realizing that most of the stuff we worry about is never going to happen anyway. And the stuff that is going to happen is going to happen whether you worry about it or not. Someone told me that in a few thousand years, an asteroid 
could make its circuits and hit this earth and blow it all to bits. I haven't lost one second of sleep worrying about that asteroid. Why? Doesn't concern me. But I'm telling you, they said next Tuesday, an asteroid is coming to destroy the earth. I don't think I'd sleep as well that night. Why? Because I'm thinking about that asteroid. But here's what I'd also think. Well, I get to go to heaven. I just hope it's a direct hit. I'd rather get hit smack on the head with an asteroid than be miles away from it and die slow with grief. It's like the atom bomb, right? If they drop the big one, I want it to be a direct hit, don't you? I want to get vaporized and wake up in the arms of Jesus. I don't want to be like others who are languishing with a smoke cloud in the distance. Listen, there's things we worry about. There's things we don't need to worry about. One thing we don't need to worry about for sure as a Christian is our eternity is safe. Our eternity is secure. Jesus has said, if you have placed your faith in me, I give you eternal life and you shall not perish. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the truth of Scripture. Lord, help us to learn. Help us not to take thought in that sense of being anxious and worrying and fretting. Lord, for, because we're so prone to do it. Help us to think better and to do better and to have more joy, to be grateful for the things that we have, to be grateful for our opportunities in our lives, to love other people, meet their needs. Lord, to live Jesus through our lives so that we have that peace that passes understanding. We pray this in Jesus' precious name.